Hello everyone, this is Paul the Okanite. In the best traditions of Monty Python, I hope to bring you something completely different than anything else I have done before. Ground combat, World War I. Despite having been in this hobby for north of 50 years, I have never played a ground-themed World War I game before. Ever. The lamps are going out. World War I is a strategic treatment of the entire war that the world suffered through from August 1914 to the armistice on November 11th, 1918. While naval and air combat make an appearance, it is highly abstracted and decidedly secondary to the ground war. LGO, now in its second edition, is published by Compass Games, designed by Kirk Ullman, and developed by none other than Herman Lutman. Herman Lutman, I thought he was a Civil War guy. The game is an area control game with armies contesting the primary theater by carrying out their attacks between adjacent areas. While I would not call it a card-driven game, cards have a major, possibly decisive, effect on the game's outcome. But players are free to perform their attacks as they see fit. Neither movement nor combat is mandated by the cards. And while many of the cards have only minor effect, some, such as Russia suing for peace, have huge game-altering effects. Let's take a look at the game package itself. Overall, LGO comes to you as a first-class package. From its sturdy box to its hard-mounted map, counters are individually mounted and require no more than a light cleanup when punched out. The game is housed in a standard and sturdy 2-inch box. Nothing like having a cover shot that includes both the Kaiser and King George, I always say. Throw in Nikki and you would have the fullness of domestic tranquility. Yeah, right. The reverse shows the usual sample of units, cards, and map, along with some basic information on the game. Complexity is given as a medium, which I agree with. I'd place it as a 5 on the 9-point GMT complexity scale. Solitaire rating is listed as high, which I also agree with. There is nothing in the game that hampers Solitaire, so I put Solitaire compatibility at an 8 on the GMT scale, and only because it is not a purpose-designed Solitaire game. The game is at the Army unit scale, quarterly turns, so the playing time of 5 hours is possible for players familiar with the game and without analysis paralysis. Unfortunately, my personal AP syndrome would add a couple hours, but yes, I could play this in a one-day session. The full-size 22 by 34 hard-mounted map shows the primary theaters of operation from the Western Alliance nations, France and Great Britain, across Central Europe over to Russia as far as Moscow. East Africa and Eastern Turkey, the Caucasus, and the Middle East are included in more abstract fashion, while truly tangential areas, such as action in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, are abstracted down to a single card and do not make an appearance on the map. Terrain is distilled down to land, water, and mountainous land, plus the Pripyat marshes and snow zones in Russia. Some areas also contain white flags representing national capitals whose capture may result in a military victory, while others have factories and numbers representing production points available to their owner. Areas are color-coded to their owning faction, such as the Western Allies, signifying ownership at the start of the game or upon the nation's entry into the war. If captured, the home alliance loses the captured area's production value, although the capturing nation does not gain it. Neutrals are likewise coded to their most closely aligned ally, such as Serbia being aligned with Russia. Counters. LGO includes approximately 185 two-sided counters that come individually mounted to their sprues and come pre-rounded. While most counters I have punched from other games using this system have punched cleanly, LGOs required a little cleanup from my 2mm Oregon Laminations Corner Punch that fit the pre-rounded corners perfectly. Nothing major, and most any sharp X-Acto blade would do the job just fine. Counters are color-coded by national groupings. For example, Britain and France are grouped together as the Western Alliance, and except for national flags, share the same background colors. Each of the other three factions also have their own uniquely identifiable counter colors. Military units have no numbers printed on them, but instead exist as either full strength units on the obverse side or spent units on the reverse side. 
Other counters include entrenchments and event markers, as well as a few utility counters. The game provides four decks of cards, one each for the Germans, Western Allies, Britain and France, Eastern Allies, Russia and the US, and the Central Allies, Austria-Hungary. Two additional decks provide 12 technology cards for each side that raise the capabilities of each of the two alliances during the game, with a grand total of 108 cards provided. Players' eight cards round out the package with the usual suspects of sequence of play, production costs, unit uh, force pool, event chits, and tables for the submarine war in the Atlantic. The rule book provides 25 pages of rules, a section of designer's notes, and a really nice extended example of play. The rules are well written and easy to follow and pose no problem to learning the game. A second book features the designer's notes specifically for the second edition, as well as several pages of descriptions on each and every event card in the game. Overall, it's a nice package for rules and uh, should provide no problems for experienced gamers to absorb. Now let's take a look at the main steps defined by the sequence of play. Each of the four faction plays their turn completely and in a prescribed order. Germany first, then Western Allies, then Eastern Allies, and finally, the Central Powers just as is done in Axis and Allies. The active faction begins by drawing the top card from the deck. Cards are tagged for the year of their appearance and may expire if not drawn within a specified year range. Factions begin the game with only the cards available in 1914. As each new year begins, cards tagged for that year are shuffled into the faction's deck of unused cards from prior years, before drawing the first card for the new year. Adding more cards in the deck per year than will be used is a huge design decision because even a player that knows the entire deck by heart cannot be 100% sure when or even if any given card will be drawn. For example, there are two turns in 1914 and three cards available for each of the four factions. It is possible, however unlikely, that the extra card for 1914 may end up shuffled to the bottom of the deck each and every year and never show up in a given game. There is no telling what will happen in each game you will play. Cards do all sorts of small things, such as giving or taking away a production point, up to and including knocking Russia out of the war and accumulating U.S. war entry points that once total eight bring the U.S. into the war. War declarations from minor powers such as Italy and Romania are likewise triggered by card pulls and players may not force countries into the war by other means. Cards, especially in the latter years, also allow players to bring new technology into the game, although that is a secondary means of learning new tech. Movement phase. There are no movement points in the game. Generally speaking, the active faction may move two units per turn to any friendly area they want to that is connected via land. The Western Allies and the U.S can also use seaborne movement from port to port. Naval units may also move, but movement is limited to being in port or in the blockade box for naval units of both sides, and in compliance with the Hague Convention or using unrestricted submarine warfare for the German U-boats. Most units simply stay where they began the turn. Combat. Combat is simple and fast. Naval combat occurs when opposing units are in the blockade box. Using a simple die roll process that is heavily favoring the Royal Navy, but may oblige them to pay for repairing friendly damaged naval units at some inopportune time. The British do not want to see their naval blockade broken, not even for a single turn. Ground combat, including post invasion beachhead combat, follows naval combat. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about how combat works in this game. Here we have an Austrian army in Ukraine next to the Russian army in Kiev. And let's assume that the Austrians are the active faction and they have declared an attack during their combat phase. Combat always occurs between one attacking army and one defending army, even if there are more than one in either or both of the areas in the combat. Combat will continue one at a time as long as the attacking force has unspent armies to attack with and they continue to desire to keep it going. Combat resolution is simple itself, no CRT needed. High roller wins. 
On a tie, in most cases, the attacker will win. When the defender has air superiority, they will win on a tie. So let's assume the following die rolls. In this case, because the Austrians rolled higher, then they will win this round of combat. When the attacker wins, both the attacker and the defender are spent. Becoming spent means that both units are flipped to their reverse side, and in this case the attacker is done because he has no more units to attack with, no more unspent units to attack with. So in order to actually take an area, the attacker has to begin with more units than the defender, or all they can do is attrite each other. In this case, if the roles were reversed, and the Russians rolled a three, and the Germans a one, the Russians would have won. Whenever the defender wins, only the attacker is spent. The defender is not spent. The attacker can continue the attack with other fresh units, but the guy in the attack that was just performed is done. Now let's assume that there are two armies in Ukraine for the Austrians trying to take the Kiev area from the Russians. Combat is performed exactly as it was before. One army in the Austrian force is designated as the attacker, and since there's only one defender, well, it's pretty easy. The high roller will win, with the exception that ties will go to the attacker. So, let's assume that the Austrians win this first attack, and both they and the Russians are spent. Unlike before, the Austrians have another army in the Ukraine, which can also do an attack, and they will attack the spent Russian army as it's the only one there. All right, let's assume that the Austrians win this role. So what happens? Well, as before, the attacker is automatically spent, win or lose. So the attacking Austrian is spent. However, the defending Russians have no units that they can flip over to their spent side. That means that the Austrians take the Kiev area and the uh, defenders have to retreat. In this case, the defeated Russians withdraw to Kursk. They are not eliminated, they simply withdraw back, and the attacking force that was in the Ukraine advances into Kiev. Note that only the attacking army that actually executed the winning attack has to go into Kiev. Anything else in the Ukraine did not have to go in. In this case, I went ahead and put the original attacking army in there as well. The choice is up to the Austrians as far as what they want to do. This example is the same as before, except that I've added an entrenchment to the Russian unit. Entrenchments in this game act like additional defenders, sort of. Any attacking army has to defeat the entrenchment before they can touch a defending army. So in this case, our Austrian army going in would be attacking the trench. Dive trolls are exactly the same as with the defending armies, high roller wins. But in this case, the entrenchment, should it uh, lose its roll, is not spent, but is uh, broken through. Unlike before, the attacking army is not spent. If an army attacking an entrenchment wins, it is not spent and can continue its attack. So the entrenchment is not quite as good as a real defending unit in some ways, and in some ways it's better because it automatically recovers at the end of this combat. And combat is defined as originating from a single area. So let's say that there were additional Austrian units in, say, the Pripyat Marshes, up over here. Uh, if they initiated an attack against Kiev, the entrenchment would be reset to being good again. It is not eliminated unless the Austrians actually take the Kiev area. So, let's assume that the Austrian wins their first roll, the entrenchment is breached, and the, and the Austrian army is not spent. So then play would proceed as we had before. We would have two armies uh, in the Ukraine for the Austrians. The guy that initiated the attack can now continue the attack into the defending Russian army, and everything will be as exactly as I've shown you before. As I said also, that should the Austrians win this combat, they will take the Kiev area. One thing that I didn't mention in the prior examples, there is a concept of the big push. Whenever an attacking army defeats a defending army, in other words, causes it to be spent, the attacking force is now considered to be doing the big push as long as they continue to win. 
that gets them an extra plus one on their die rolls. So let's assume that this attacking Austrian that breached the trench line makes a second attack. As I said, entrenchments does not cause him to go spent as long as he wins the attack. So here he is now attacking the defending Russian unit, and let's assume that he wins it. So at that point, both the Russian and the attacking Austrian would become spent. But in addition, the Austrians would get a big push marker. And we would be left with this situation, with the uh, Russian spent, the first Austrian that attacked the trench line, because he won it, he was not spent, continued his attack into the Russian army and won that attack, and of course is spent as they are always spent attacking armies, win or lose. All right, now the second Austrian army continues the attack by declaring his attack on the Kiev area, there's only one Russian in the defending area, which is Kiev, and he is spent. So we have a fresh Austrian army attacking a spent Russian. Okay, so we roll the die again. High roller wins. Ties go to the attacking force. In addition, the Austrians get the plus one for the big push. And so they would be winning ties and getting a plus one on their die roll, making it very likely that they're going to win this follow-on attack and get the Russian armies out of Kiev and push them back to Kursk or some other neighboring area. All right, let's have another example. Here we have a force of Austrians, two armies, with a heavy artillery unit. The defender is a sole Russian army, but he has two levels of entrenchment. You can have up to two entrenchment counters in any one area, except for areas that contain mountains. They can have only one. So uh, here we have two in with the Russian unit and the attacking force for the Austrians. All right, so one of the attacking Austrians is going to begin the assault, and let's say decides to use the artillery as well. Artillery never attacks by itself. It only attacks in conjunction with a friendly army. So in this case, we got one Austrian going in, and the artillery is going to support that attack. What the artillery does is allows the attacker to roll an additional die at at least medium technology levels. Under some circumstances in the higher technologies, he'd get to roll a third. But for now, let's just say he gets an extra die. So it'd be two dice for the Germans, one dice for the Russians, and once again, high roller wins. Let's assume that the Germans rolled a high die, and of course it would have to be on the entrenchment. In this case, the entrenchment is breached, the artillery fire is done, and the Austrian that initiated the attack could continue the attack into the second trench line. My reading of the rules basically says that only the infantry unit gets to continue the attack unspent. The artillery gets one shot and one shot only. So, to attack the second trench line with artillery, there would have to be a second artillery unit in the Ukraine. And there's not. And finally, here is a fairly realistic view of what it would look like in the north of Italy to show you what two areas that are bucked up against each other might actually look like during the game. So here we have uh, three Austrian units with an entrenchment in a mountainous area versus four attacking armies with one unit of artillery support. In this case, the Anglo-French would have to breach the entrenchment. That has to be the first thing that they attack. If they do, they can continue the attack and try to defeat one of the defending Austrians. Whether they do it or not, the unit attacking is spent. The defender will be spent only if they lose. And this continues until the Anglo-French call it off, or they simply have no more armies to attack with. Now, if we go to the Western Front, the armies are going to get even bigger, deeper, more stuff going on. Eventually, both sides will have counter-battery technology, in which case the artillery pieces can shoot defensively as well as offensively. Until you have counter-battery technology, artillery can only shoot offensively. So in a nutshell, that's how the land combat works in this game. Now let's go ahead and pop back into the sequence of play and pick up with the production phase. The production phase. The production phase sees the construction of new military units, entrenchments, and the resolution of U-boat attrition and U-boat attacks. Production points are accumulated and spent on a per-nation basis. 
Nations coexisting within the same faction, such as France and Great Britain, may not combine their resources and expenditures just because they are both in the Western alliance. They can, however, transfer points to other major powers and minor powers up to the receiving nation's production point capacity at the start of the game. For example, Britain, having seven production points, may transfer up to four points per turn to France because France begins the game with a total production capacity of four. Most minor powers have zero production capacity, and the game allows them to receive a total of one point per turn as an exception to the general rule. It's a good thing because minor nations such as Serbia will quickly see their armies attrite to nothing if they do not receive foreign support. While nations can use points to build new units from their force pool, far and away, the most common use for production is to rebuild spent armies back to their obverse, fully combat-effective side. Time and again, nations will throw their units at opposing forces, only to get spent awaiting a rebuild. This is World War I after all, mix and repeat. Finally, Production point transfers within a faction have a one-turn delay before the points may be used, as the phase that receives and consumes the point occurs before the phase that permits the donation to happen in the first place. Therefore, when Britain transfers two points to France on turn two, France will not be able to use the points until turn three. Submarine attacks occur during the Western Allies production phase by rolling 2d6 per active sub on the U-boat table. Technologies, both Triple Entente and Central Powers, can make submarine attacks more or less likely to succeed. Successful U-boat attacks rob Great Britain of one protection point per success, and with only two subs in the game, the maximum loss per turn is two. Another 2d6 is rolled per active subunit during the German production phase. Results determine whether the active sub performing the role will continue as active or will the counter be flipped to the reverse, making the unit spent. As before, technologies possessed by both sides modify the outcome of the die rolls, for better or for worse. The regroup phase. Each faction's move concludes by flipping artillery units to their active side. This is done at no cost in production. The Western Allies and Germany also conduct aerial dogfights during the regroup phase. Each side's aerial technology, or P-level, determines both the maximum number of areas in which they can assert air superiority and the number of dogfight dice they get to roll. Air superiority confers defensive benefits to ground units within the area it is placed. Technology. Germany and the Western Allies each draw one technology card from the deck once each turn. Technology cards are categorized by function, such as air artillery or air power, and further rated with a technology level of 1, 2, or 3. Note that some technologies, such as counter-battery fire, are limited to level 1, but others go up to level 3. Level 1 technologies are always and permanently added to an alliance's technology trove. The exception, poison gas, is returned to the technology deck upon its use. Technologies above level 1 can only be learned if the immediately preceding technology is already learned. If the prerequisite technology is known, then the new technology just drawn also becomes known. Otherwise, the card is returned to the deck unlearned. This system naturally slows down the pace of learning technology in the early years of the war when there are more cards in the deck and accelerate it as the deck empties out. Very cool. And as noted earlier, later war years also have event cards triggering technology upgrades, further accelerating technology adoption as the game proceeds. Victory. Victory is earned in two ways. First, military victory. Military victory is achieved by capturing key white flag areas generally containing major capitals such as Paris or Berlin. Military victories can occur at any point in the game. Second, armistice. If there is no military victory, the game goes full term to the fall of 1918. At that point, victory points are tallied and the victor is determined. To win, the central powers, including Germany, must score at least seven points more than the Triple Entente. 
points are scored as follows. First, for knocking Russia out of the war, the Central Powers earn four victory points. No more than four points can be earned for knocking Russia out of the war. Second, if the U.S. never enters the war, one point is granted to the Central Powers. Third, for whatever side completely takes over East Africa, they earn one point. Note that the Germans will never conquer East Africa unless the British are asleep at the switch. And fourth, one point for each home area that is conquered, plus one point for each square production zone. These zones only exist by Turkey. They would be granted for any of Sinai, Basra, and the Caucasus. Should the Central Powers fail to score seven or more points than the Triple Entente, then the Triple Entente wins. So now here's what I think of the game. First, realize this is a game recreating World War I. The Western Front is all of two areas wide and will be packed with units. There will be a lot of dice rolling, and units will be spent left, right, and center, and then rebuilt to do it all over again. If a fight develops between Italy and Austria-Hungary, you will learn why some of those battles were numbered in the teens, as in the 13th battle of whatever. Only in Russia can you see some movement, but unless you are going for a military victory, that will stall out at some point as well. If it doesn't, then you probably have weakened the Western Front too much. Good news? You only need to control four Russian areas for the Bolsheviks to take Russia out of the war. But then, when will that card come? Will it ever come? Second, to enjoy this game, you have to embrace the idea that your war may not unfold as the real war did. In my first game, Russia collapsed in the spring of 1917, but the Americans never entered the war. In 1916, the French staged a very successful assault, kicking Germany out of Belgium and carried the attack through to take Hanover. Disaster! But there is a sort of last-ditch defense rule that by eliminating an army from the force pool and receiving a successful die roll, the advance may be denied. It did, and at the end, the Western Allies controlled exactly the same areas that they did in 1914. Four years of war, and nothing changed except the population of Europe. The Entente won by one point, but only because they took all of East Africa. Finally, while the combat system is simple, you will do a lot of it, and it can get repetitive. When taking a single area can be the difference between winning and losing, yeah, it's something you need to do, but will the eighth battle of the sum really be fun? The answer to that question is, of course, up to you. For me, while I believe the game does a good job simulating the First World War in an approachable, learnable, and high-quality package, I'm just not sure I like World War I enough to get LGO back on my game table anytime soon. Lots of games, so little time. In conclusion, I think the game is a bit overrated on BGG. The 308 rating may be a bit generous, while the 7.7 .7 score is closer to where I would put it. If you force me, I would give it a 7, but I can see where someone with different preferences than I would give it a higher rating. The game is good, but it may not be great for everyone. I thank you for staying with me through this review. If you like what you saw, please consider hitting the subscribe button. It helps you by making it easier for you to follow along what I'm up to, and it makes the channel stronger and more viable going forward. Truly a win-win proposition for us both. And with that, let me wish you all a pleasant evening. Bye for now.